Welcome, Ben Mama. In the last console generation, upgrades became a big talking point as the PS4 Pro and Xbox One X both arrived offering full backwards compatibility, whilst also boasting improved performance. In the case of Sony's system, there was even more incentive to upgrade, given that PSVR only worked on this model. Microsoft then took the upgrade route one step further by making the new Xbox Series S and Series X consoles fully backwards compatible with the Xbox One, giving their users an instant library of great games. But console upgrades are far from a new thing. Many manufacturers decided to try this route in the past too, taking their existing hardware, making a number of improvements to its performance, and releasing it as a new console. And no, I don't mean console revisions here, like the Mega Drive 2 or Atari 2600 Junior for example, or even small changes to the same hardware, like the addition of a backlight on the Game Boy, or stereo sound on the Atari Lynx. We are talking about consoles with revised chipsets that saw noticeable improvements to the graphics, sound, or processing power. In this video, I'm going to tell the stories of five such systems, consoles that took the existing hardware and improved it to create a new system, but not the ones that made a success of it like the Game Boy Color or the Sega Master System, these are the consoles from manufacturers that thought they were onto a winner before failing hard, proving that sometimes the upgrades just aren't worth it. Great games can be rewarding or intensely frustrating. This is no exception. The Philips Video Pack Computer Games System. These plug-in cartridges are all programmed for different games. Cards. Even a challenging round of golf. Philips, simply years ahead. Now let's start off with a pretty strange one, because all other consoles in this video are upgrades on already successful hardware, but given that the RCA Studio 2 was a huge failure itself in the marketplace, it seems somewhat bizarre that the company would even bother to develop a follow-up. But there is a little more to this story than first meets the eye, as I'll endeavour to explain. If you have any knowledge or experience of the Studio 2, then you'll know that it only produced black and white visuals but further research shows that this wasn't the original intention. The original design for the console included a circuit to output colour, but at some point during its development this was removed. Some have speculated that this was purely a cost saving measure, but it's also possible that they couldn't get it working correctly for the date of the Studio 2's release in January 1977. Now this part is actually pretty important, because RCA were more than aware that the Atari video computer system was on the horizon, I knew that they had to beat it to market to achieve any kind of success. After the Studio 2 was released, the hardware was modified further to make the colour circuit work as intended, but RCA themselves decided against releasing this enhanced version of the console themselves, and instead they licensed the hardware to two manufacturers in different parts of the world, Sheen in Europe and Visicom in Japan. Both the Sheen, M12000 and Visicom video computer system had colour games released for them, but failed to achieve any kind of market success. Both systems are very rare and highly sought after by hardcore collectors. Following on from the Magnavox Odyssey in 1972, Philips follow-up was first released as the Video Pack G7000 in Europe in December 1978, with the renamed North American Magnavox Odyssey 2 following shortly afterwards in February 1979. It was also released in both Japan and South America too, giving the console true worldwide appeal. In fact, it might surprise some people to know that the Philips Video Pack and its regional variants actually finished in third place during its console generation, only being beaten out by the behemoth that was the Atari 2600, which nobody was going to catch, and the much more powerful Mattel in television. So with this solid base, it was inevitable that Philips would work on a follow-up for release in 1983, and it would be known as the Video Pack G7400 and Magnavox Odyssey 3 in North America. Despite these plans, the console was only ever released in Europe, 
for reasons I'll get onto in a moment. But what you need to know is that this new system will not only be backwards compatible, but also feature state of the art, well, for the time anyway, hardware that offered a pretty big step up from the existing console. Amongst the many improvements were high resolution backgrounds and sprites, more RAM, extra video memory, a faster CPU and a proper sound chip. They even designed the system so that many games would play on both consoles with upgraded features on the new system, something that Microsoft copied with the Xbox One X many years later. But anyone who knows their video game history will be aware of something else much more important that happened in 1983, the North American video game crash. This decimated the market for consoles and games in Magnavox's home territory, and the Odyssey 2 very much became one of the first casualties of that. However, over in Europe, video pack sales were still going strong for Philips, so they decided to plough on regardless, concentrating all support for the system on their own home territory, and subsequently cancelled the much-hyped release of the Magnavox Odyssey 3 in North America. Despite the large market share, sales of the G7400 were disappointing, as most Europeans began to move on to cheap home computers like the Sinclair ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64. If you want to find out more about this story, then follow the link in the top right hand corner or description, as I've already done a whole video on this fascinating system. I was actually in two minds whether to include this one in the video at all, but the more I read about the shop Twin Famicom, the more I thought it was worthy of inclusion. Like a couple of other entries in this list, the Twin Famicom was a console that was originally planned for release by the creator of the technology in question, but ultimately marketed and manufactured by somebody else. From the moment Nintendo created the Famicom Disk System, it was rumoured that they would follow up with an all-in-one system. I mean, why wouldn't they? It makes perfect sense. But why Nintendo chose to palm the Twin Famicom off to somebody else is actually as surprising as it is baffling. Now for those who don't know, the Famicom Disk System already featured extra technology, but upgraded the main console when connected, in the form of enhanced 6-channel PCM sound and an extra 40k of RAM, with 32k reserved for the disk cache itself. So the Twin Famicom retained these features, as well as adding improved audio and visual outputs and a new BIOS. This is all well and good, but there was one much speculated feature that was completely omitted, and there doesn't seem to be any logical reason why. You see, the Twin Famicom can only be switched between playing cartridges or loading discs. There is absolutely no way to combine the two. This design decision seems utterly ludicrous, as there was so much potential there that could be exploited, from simply using discs to save your game, to using the medium to deliver extra content, a retro version of DLC if you will. Like Nintendo's disc system, the Sharp Twin Famicom was only ever released in Japan, with no Western NES version ever planned. It was only produced for two years, 1986 and 1987, before being discontinued completely. Due to the unit's high price, it never sold in large numbers and is now extremely rare and sought after by collectors. Clearly inspired by the release of the NEC Turbo Duo, an all-in-one PC engine and Super CD-ROM console the year before, Sega set about developing a combined Mega Drive and Mega CD console too. This was a welcome announcement, because the original combo was a pretty bulky setup, with the console sitting on top of the large CD unit. However, after the less than stellar response to the Mega CD, Sega had a bit of a change of heart, and instead handed the technology over to Victor Company of Japan, better known to us in the West as JVC. The Victor Wonder Mega was first released in Japan in 1992, and as well as combining both units into one, it also offered up a number of quite interesting upgrades on the existing technology. By far the biggest upgrade was the addition of a digital signal processor. The DSP chip greatly enhanced the audio quality, as well as giving access to a MIDI port for connecting up keyboards and other electronic instruments. It also allowed you to hook up two microphones to use the Wonder Mega as a karaoke machine, and they even included a karaoke disc with the system to get you started. This wasn't all though, as there were also some more minor upgrades including better audio and video output, a motorised pop-up disc tray, and on later models, wireless controllers too. Rather bizarrely, Sega would soon come back to their baby by releasing their own Sega branded versions of the Wonder Mega, although these are much more unusual. Even more bizarrely, it took Victor two years to bring the console to North America, where it was renamed as the rather strange sounding JVC XI. Numerous different revisions of the Wonder Mega and XI were produced until it was finally discontinued in 1995, 
but none of them ever sold in high numbers. The Wondermaker was never anything more than a high-end, high-priced curiosity for people with money to burn. There were never any games released that took advantage of the Wondermaker's extra hardware, despite promises to the contrary, which is a great shame as there was clearly a lot of potential to create early versions of things like the Just Sing series and Guitar Hero franchise. When people think about failed console upgrades, the NEC Super Graphics is going to be the prime candidate. Whilst most of the others on this list survived for a short time and achieved enough success to see support from their manufacturers, the same can't be said of the Super Graphics. This console failed hard, really hard, and this is only emphasised further by the huge success of its predecessor, the PC Engine. Developed by the famous Hudson Soft and released in North America as the TurboGrafx-16, the PC Engine sold over 7 million units worldwide, with nearly 700 games released during its commercial life, and was recently re-released as a mini console by current owners of Hudson Soft, Konami. It also claimed several firsts, such as the very first CD-ROM drive on the console, and being the first system released in the 16-bit console generation, arriving in 1987 a full year before the Sega Mega Drive debuted in Japan, and three years before the Super Nintendo. The final announcement of the Super Graphics followed lots of rumours and speculation about what NEC had planned, including some failed negotiations with arcade giants Namco to acquire their mysterious 16-bit Super System console. I actually did a story or video on this very subject some time ago, so if you want to find out more about what could have been, then click that link in the top right hand corner. Given that the PC Engine was known for its small form factor, people were pretty surprised by the big brutish design of the Super Graphics. It really couldn't have been a bigger departure, but boy does it look cool. Compared to the PC Engine, the Super Graphics had four times the amount of main RAM and a second video chip with its own video RAM. It also included a proprietary controller chip, which allowed the output of both video chips to be combined in various ways to create clever effects such as multiple playfields. NEC also announced an accessory called the Power Console, designed to add a full flight, yoke, throttle and keypad to the Super Graphics that would slide over the entire console. Besides a prototype being produced, no Power Consoles were ever released to retail. Since the Super Graphics was produced and marketed as an upgraded PC Engine model, rather than as a new platform, it was backwards compatible with all existing PC Engine Hue cards. It was also compatible with the Super CD-ROM add-on 2, and new CD games were promised to took advantage of the extra features on offer, although none ever arrived. In fact, there were only ever 5 games released for the Super Graphics full stop, with one further game, Darius Plus, offering enhanced features when played on the new hardware. There are many reasons for the failure of the Super Graphics, not limited to the high price of the system and its games, as well as consumers feeling that the improvements just weren't radical enough to warrant the higher price of the upgrade and they felt that they were best off sticking with the standard consoles. It's said that less than 100,000 units were sold in total and the console was never released outside of Japan. NEC never recovered from this failure and their later 32-bit console, the PCFX, suffered very much the same fate. And that rounds up my look at 5 failed console upgrades. Can you think of any other examples that should have made the list? And which of these systems would you like to add most to your own collection? I always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Dos Gaming Man, Tiago Piera Dos Santos Silva, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host director content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the lad, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.